like to thank you and welcome you to coming. Uh, today is uh, March 9th, 2012, 3912. It's a year since the Japan's earthquake that um, was devastating in and of itself. Um, subsequently, there was a tsunami warning and last year's conference was canceled. Um, and it happened right around this very same time a year ago. So that was the 13th annual conference, which was canceled. And so if you're superstitious, there's where 13 comes in. I'm, I'm extremely excited to spend an entire day dedicated to the discussion around suicide. Um, I, would, I would have to say right up front that I think that's part of the problem is there isn't enough discussion around suicide. Typically, it's we're sad to hear and let's not talk about it anymore. So the more we talk about it, the more we look at the causes, uh, the more likely we are to interrupt that devastating event in people's lives. My name is George Jaron. I'm the director of Behavioral Health Services at Dominican Hospital. I'm also the conference chairperson. Today's uh, event, in part, is being videotaped for future cable cast on community television of Santa Cruz County. And um, each year we've had community television for the last six or seven years uh, tape these events, which is a, a, a really great thing. I say this every year, I want to say it each time, that uh, the community at large um, gets the benefit of the information that we're all going to receive here today. Um, at this time now, um, I'd like to introduce to you Joshua Nadenherty Calciano. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad uh, there's no barricades this year. Last year was maybe these first three tables, and then it was a big empty room. So there were maybe 10 people that were able to, to get through, and that was about it. So it's definitely nice to speak to a full house. I want to welcome all of you to our 14th annual symposium. And I wish to welcome all of the new attendees, as well as our students, and our tablers, our exhibitors. And during the break, I really encourage you, that I think this is our fourth year doing the tabling, and I really do encourage you to network with these people. That's, that's the goal of bringing them in, is to network so that we all have the resources that we need. My brother John was 23 years old when he passed away, and over the years I have often wondered what his life would have been like today. <clears throat> what he would have done with his life, what he would have been happy. And although these questions will remain forever answered in our mind, my mind, one thing I know is for certain is, is that his life, as well as his death, did have a purpose. Although this symposium bears his name, I believe it has come to represent the countless families that um, are inflicted with violence, and drugs, and suicide. Our family is incredibly great, gratified to have seen this symposium in memory of our brother and son, John, to develop over the years into the widely attended event of today. Excuse me. I'll compose myself here. <clears throat> we, continue to be con uh, we continue to be impressed by the literally hundreds of practitioners, clinicians, educators, parents, and public safety officials that have attended this symposium year after year. Your post symposium comments and the number of attendees that return indicate that we really are making a difference in our community. Our deepest appreciation goes out to the advisory committee who meets every month to select topics and speakers, as well as our countless volunteers, members of the Guild, and the Dominican Hospital Foundation who, with their help, we've been to establish the uh, Johnny e. Natterney Endowment Fund. That will allow us to live these, these symposiums to continue in perpetuity. And of course, all of you, for your de devotion and your quest for knowledge is what allows us to continue our work. So in summary, I want to thank all of you for being a part of this symposium today and hope you find that this information useful in your clinical work. And now, in the words that, of my mother that have inspired me over the years, <clears throat> These symposiums are a wonderful legacy and give a real sense of purpose to John's life. Thank you. Let's 
speech never gets easier. <laughs> um, before I introduce our next uh, speaker, I want to uh, just take a second. A lot of you, I know you've gone onto our website and registered and whatnot, and I, it's, I want you to know that it's not just a, a place to register, it's a place to gather community resources. Um, and we took quite a bit of time developing it into uh, areas for past symposiums where if, for example, if you were not here in 2006, we had a methamphetamine conference, you're actually able to download those PowerPoints directly from our slide, our website. Um, also this past year, with the help of uh, Diane Bridgman, we've established uh, on, our, on our website, if you go to our community resource page, this is a, about a 10 page document that has all of the community resources as much as, as we have from crisis emergencies to food, homeless services. So really, I, I do encourage you um, today or tomorrow um, to go on our website and, and spend some time looking through it, and it's there for you as a community resource. So now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Bonnie Sultan, who is the Assistant Program Director for Suicide Prevention Services for the Central Coast. Bonnie. Good morning, everyone. Hi. I'm Bonnie Sultan. I'm the Assistant Program Director for Suicide Prevention for the Central Coast. We serve Santa Cruz County, Monterey County, and San Benito County. Um, on behalf of Suicide Prevention and the Family Service Agency, we first want to thank you for all being here, taking your time to learn more about suicide and suicide prevention. And we appreciate your effort and interest in this work. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among 25 to 35 age group. It's the third leading cause of death among ages 15 to 24. Suicide is a national issue and it's a personal issue. Everyone has been impacted by suicide, either personally or through their community. According to the Center for Disease Control, suicide was the 11th leading cause of death for all ages in 2007. In 2008, more than 36,000 Americans died from suicide, and another 666,000 went to the hospital emergency for an attempted suicide. Daily, there are at least 1,500 suicide attempts. Among adults ages 65 and older, there are approximately four suicide attempts for every suicide, and among ages 15 to 24, there are approximately 100 to 200 attempts for every suicide. Among counties in California, Santa Cruz was ranked 29th out of 58 for suicide. These numbers are very large, and they're almost impossible to understand and comprehend. We at Suicide Prevention understand the numbers and understand that these numbers are each individual people. These are people that are connected to others, they're connected to you, and we're here to serve you and our community. The impact of suicide is a ripple effect, and we also feel that healing is a ripple effect that we can help to promote at Suicide Prevention. We've been serving the community for over 47 years. We have a volunteer base of over 70 individuals on our crisis line 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We offer emergency suicide service to anyone and everyone, and we offer these services in 150 languages and dialects. So within one minute, we can connect you to someone who can speak your language and who can talk you through a crisis. We believe in normalizing suicide, and we believe that suicide is a thought that everyone has had, and we wanna make sure that through normalizing suicide, we can help to destigmatize this issue. And it's events such as this and people such as yourself that by talking about it and coming together, people can come to get the assistance that they really do need. We believe that stigma can also be reduced in education and communication. We offer outreach services and education in schools. We offer this to professionals. We offer this to emergency responders, police, and we also offer it to people in the emergency 911. We're here to help you to de-escalate, and we're also here to talk about these issues. Reducing the stigma of suicide is saving the lives of those that we love. 
We believe that suicide can be prevented by creating a safe space. And at Suicide Prevention, we offer the space for individuals to talk about their feelings, to talk about their loss, and to talk about their sense of being overwhelmed. We understand that suicide many times is not about death. It's about feeling that you have a lack of options. It's feeling that you have no control, and it's feeling that you don't have any other way to end whatever is happening in your life. We believe that when it's a safe space, we can talk about options, we can talk about regaining control, and we can talk about feeling normal, that you're feeling overwhelmed. We've taken a look at some studies, and of those that have survived their suicide attempt while in the hospital, 24 to 48 hours after they have attempted to take their own life, researchers go in and they say, are you happy that you survived? Or do you wish that your suicide was successful? 93% quoted saying they're glad they didn't die and they just wanted something to change. If we understand that suicide is not always about death, we can create a safe space for people to talk about these options. We can create a space for people to talk about loss and the need for connection. It's when isolation occurs that people feel that suicide is their only option. We at Suicide Prevention provide that to you on the line, in trainings, and we're also here in person. So our survivor crisis line has 70 volunteers. Everyone is trained in de-escalization. They're trained in reflective listening, and they're trained in being a responsive individual. We're there to make a connection with people who feel isolated. This is a key point in suicide. The things that you'll be hearing about today talk about people feeling not connected and feeling isolated from their community. We also have a resource table here. So if you're interested in learning more about suicide prevention, if you're learning about how you can become a first responder on our crisis line, we welcome you to do this. And we welcome you to talk to us after about how we can create more of a community with you and your agency. It's my great honor to now introduce Lisa Firestone. She's a clinical psychologist and the Director of Research and Education at the Glendon Association in Santa Barbara, California. She's been involved in clinical training and applied research in the suicide, violence, and interpersonal relationships. She's the co-author of the Firestone Assessment of Self-Destructive Thoughts, known as FAST, Scale and Manual, and the Firestone Assessment of Suicide Intent, known as FASI. It's a scale manual instruments that measure the risk of self-destructive and suicidal behavior. She's also the senior editor at psychalive.org, and we certainly recommend that you take care of that. Thank you again for your time and your assistance, and we look forward to speaking with you after. Take care. Um, first of all, I want to thank um, John's family for inviting me here today. And um, I think it's important to acknowledge that most of the advances that have happened in terms of suicide prevention have been mainly driven by family members who've lost loved ones to suicide. Um, that activism and that wanting to make a significant contribution based on the loss of their loved one has led to a lot of the advances that we've had over the years um, in suicide prevention in this country. So I think it's really important and I really um, want to commend John's family for what they're doing. So I'm going to be talking to you today about youth suicide and oh, let's see how this works. So um, we had some facts and figures, and um, I'm just going to go over this real briefly because of that, my suicide slide, my statistic slides. But um, so as you see, again, this is the third leading cause of death for young people in our country. And if we look at the top three things that are killing young people in our country, it's substance, it's accidents, homicides, and suicides, all related to lifestyle issues. So while we're doing a good job of fighting disease, we're struggling with some of these issues of lifestyle that are killing our young people. Also, when we look at attempts, the majority of suicide attempts are made by young people. 
For every young person that dies by suicide, there's an estimated 100 attempts, whereas in older individuals, it's more like a four to one ratio. And if we look at uh, research from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, what we see is in the typical high school classroom, one male and two females have probably attempted suicide within the last year. Now when you say this to high school teachers, they get horrified, but that's the students that they're looking out on. And when I talk to ninth grade health classes in our community in Santa Barbara, just down the road from here, um, almost all of the young people know a friend who's been suicidal at one point or another. And my big take home message to kids is you can't afford to keep your friends secret. You need to tell somebody, you need to reach out to somebody who can help. Um, again, there are completed suicide is kind of the tip of the iceberg of the problem that we're talking about today. Um, we have many more attempts, many more people who end up in the hospital needing services. And um, what we see is that suicide rates go up throughout adolescence. Um, they're very low in younger children, but they do go up and then they kind of level off looking like uh, older adults. If we look at uh, data from California, um, these were the suicides for 2009 by gender in California of young people. And this is different counties. Uh, within California, the green line is California as a whole. Uh, the yellow line is Sacramento County and uh, the purple line, Fresno County. So this is just looking at the suicide rates um, and the red line is Los Angeles County in California. Um, this is looking at it again by county. And we see that there's a real range of differences, that there's some areas where we're having many more youth suicides than others within California. And um, there's also the breakdown ethnically. You know, overall our rate of suicide in California has actually declined some. That has happened in conjunction with our state um, becoming more Hispanic. And that's partly because there's lower suicide rates in that population in general. That doesn't mean that we don't lose young people from this population though. We in Santa Barbara had a suicide cluster a couple years ago of young Hispanic males. This is an unusual group, but um, it was a cluster that we have that we were able to put a stop to as well by forming something we call the Santa Barbara Response Network, where we go in and respond after there's been an act of suicide or violence in our community to help calm things down. Um, what we see is that the suicide rates over a 16 year period, and the most recent um, data we have is for 2009, um, because our death reporting system in the United States is underfunded. Um, and rather broken, and so we have data that is somewhat behind. We're just starting to get figures now for 2009. But what it looks like is that since the economic crisis, suicide rates are going up. And they're going up particularly among working age people. And if we look at the data that we have from Europe, um, where their death reporting system is not as broken or as underfunded, in the countries with the, the greater the financial crisis in a country, the higher the suicide rate has gone, and particularly when there's a lack of a safety net. Um, so this topic is important because suicide is the third leading cause of death for youth, 10 to 24 years old. In 2009, 6.3% of ninth to 12th graders reported having attempted suicide one or more times in the past year. Approximately 149,000 young people, 10 to 24, are treated for self-inflicted uh, injuries in U.S. emergency departments every year. And according to data collected by the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control, poisoning is the most common reason for intentional self-inflicted, non-fatal injury hospitalizations for the 10 to 24-year-old age group. And self-injurious behavior in general is often stigmatized and hidden from family and friends. So we don't even know all of the suicide attempts that occur among this population. I think we have a very uh, large underestimate. For instance, we have a young man in our community, uh, 20 years old, who became suicidal after the breakup of a relationship, not an uncommon trigger. Um, and uh, when he went to be evaluated in the emergency room, it turns out he had two prior attempts. When he was nine, he attempted to hang himself. When he was 16, he cut his wrist. On the phone with his father, his father had no idea, didn't know about either previous suicide attempt. His parents were divorced when he was a young child, but he's closest to his father of all people in the world, and his father didn't know about those prior attempts. 
Um, what we see is that one in 10 people who die by suicide have been in the emergency department within two months of their losing their life. If we did better screening in emergency rooms, we could do a lot to prevent suicide. These people are not only showing up for suicidal ideation or for suicidal behavior, but they're injuring themselves more because they're doing more risk-taking behaviors. <clears throat> in terms of uh, suicide in adolescents, a previous suicide increases the suicide risk by 38 to 40 times. So this young man, whose father I was talking to, having two or more attempts astronomically increases risk much more over one attempt. And I'll talk a little later about multiple attempters and how they're different. Um, also, it was found that a suicide attempt is likely to be highest among youth presenting with a combination of depression and externalizing behavior. And kids that are externalizing, like the young men that we lost in our community, um, were involved in gang activity. Um, and those with a romantic breakup is often a precipitator again for young men and being assaulted or having been arrested. And a number of the young men we lost were thought that they were on the verge of getting arrested. It turned out they were not. More than 90% of adult suicide attempters and 80% of adolescent attempters and completers communicate suicidal ideation prior to the attempt. They tell somebody. We have a young man who was very prominent in our community because he was a athlete and uh, star of the uh, basketball team and had been in the newspapers a lot, who took his life on the Cold Springs Arch Bridge, which has become a hot spot in Santa Barbara for suicide, until just the other day, uh, last week, we got the barriers finally erected on our bridge, um, an effort that was a combination of our organization, the Glendon Association, Caltrans, and our local sheriffs, because they had two sheriffs who almost lost their lives on the bridge trying to save somebody. And the sheriff who was on the bridge the day that this young man took his life, who tried to engage him and couldn't, um, was traumatized by the experience himself. Um, and adolescents with, adolescents with prior attempts are 18 times more likely to make future attempts. This behavior gets easier and easier to do. And half of youth who attempt suicide do not receive treatment um, beyond psychotropic medication. In the case of this young man that I was just talking about in our community, he didn't get any treatment for either of his attempts. In terms of college students, um, self-reported suicidal ideation in college students ranges from 32 to 70 percent of college students report having had suicidal ideation. Again, this is not an unusual thing. It's a taboo topic that we don't talk about, yet it's really common that people think about it. It's estimated that there are 1,100 suicides on college campuses in the U.S. every year. And suicide is the second leading cause of death in college-age students. And it's often the straight-A student who's getting their first B, who's more at risk than the person who's flunking out. And this is something we need to think about. We also need to think about the fact that we have a lot of returning soldiers now going to college who are going to be a high-risk population, and you'll hear more about the military issue um, from Dr. Jan Kemp. One in 12 college students have seriously contemplated suicide. Um, what's the implications of all this data? The implication is there's a need to intervene early in the developmental trajectory of depression and suicidal behavior. The earlier we intervene, um, the more we can do to prevent suicide. So here's some common misconceptions, suicides, misconceptions about suicide that keep us from intervening. One is that most suicides are caused by one particular triggering event, so there's no time for us to intervene. Um, it was the breakup of a relationship. Well, it doesn't work like that. There has, there's often a triggering event that is the catalyst. It's like the straw that breaks the camel's back. But this is a person who's been struggling for a long time. If we look at the last young man that we lost in our community who was 16 at the time of his death, when he was eight years old, his elementary school counselor identified him as being suicidal. This had been going on a long time. And in males, we find that it starts as young as age eight. And with young women, it more starts at puberty. Uh, another idea is most suicides occur with little or no warning, so how are we supposed to do anything? This is simply not true. Mostly, there has been this buildup. There have been people who've known that this person was at risk. And often, they've talked about it directly. The young man who we lost off the bridge 
um, told his friends, he would say things like, maybe I should just kill myself. And his friends would say, really, are you going to do that? And he would say, what, are you telling me I should? And guess what, they backed off, right? Suicidal people put it out there and take it back in a way that makes it hard to respond. The night before his suicide, when his friends asked him, what are you doing tomorrow night? He said, I'm jumping off a bridge. And they said, really, are we going to see you? And he said, well, if the bridge thing doesn't work out. Well, unfortunately, the bridge thing did happen. And, um, you know, they didn't know whether to take it seriously or not. Another idea is that if we don't talk about it, it won't happen. This doesn't work, right? We've been trying this for a long time. It's time to break the silence and to get talking about it. And I really commend all of you for being here today and being part of that. Another idea is people who talk about it, especially young people, don't really do it. They're just trying to manipulate us. They're just trying to get our attention. Another thing that happened in my conversation with the father of this young man who got hospitalized the other day, his father was like, well, you know, he was just trying to get his girlfriend's attention. Now she's paying attention. She went with him to the hospital. It wasn't just that. True, there's an element of that. We used to think there was people who were really manipulative around suicide and people who were really serious, and that they were two different populations. Turns out that now we know that some of the most manipulative people around suicide are also the most lethal. It doesn't work like that. They're not two nice, distinct populations. Another idea is people who make suicide attempts, especially minor league or not very lethal attempts, are just trying to get our attention. But if we ignore people's attempt to get our attention by risking their own lives, what are we telling them? You have to do more to get my attention? I think that's a big mistake. We have a young woman in our community who, when she was 12, she took some aspirin as a suicide attempt, told her mom right away. Not a very lethal attempt. Second time, she took a little bit more medication. But again, she told her mom. She got to the hospital. Third time, she jumped off a cliff. Broke almost every bone in her body. Has mild brain damage from the attempt. Doesn't remember it. We need to take these attempts seriously. Another idea is a suicidal person clearly wants to die, so why should we try to stop them? This is just not true. People who die by suicide are ambivalent. Part of them wants to die, but part of them wants to live. And just to stress this, I'll give you the example of the Golden Gate Bridge. There have been something like 29 people who survived that jump, which is almost 100% lethal jump. It's a very lethal jump. All of them say the minute they jumped, they wish they hadn't. And you'll hear Kevin Hines say this on tape um, that I'll share with you in a minute. Another idea is a person who suddenly has been depressed and they're suddenly feeling better. We don't have to worry about their suicide risk anymore, right? They're feeling better. This is not true. When people are in a lot of psychological pain and distress and they come up with a solution, which is to end their own lives, they feel relieved. Often they look much happier than they have in a long time. And you'll hear Kevin talk about this as well. That feeling um, is when we need to reassess for risk. So here's just a brief clip. We're going to see three individuals who appear throughout the films that we've made on suicide prevention, one for the public and one for professionals, uh, talking about the thoughts that they were experiencing just prior to their attempts. Ooh, OK. I think somebody's going to have to do it from down there. You have to click on it. Thanks, Sarah. You're alone. You'll die alone. You'll always be alone. The only thing you can do is, is go and kill yourself. I start to think things like, if you don't matter, what does matter? Nothing matters. What are you waking up for? You know you hate waking up every morning. Why bother? It's so, it's so agonizing to wake up in the morning. Why bother doing it? Just end it. Just end it. I got out of the Golden Gate Bridge, still begging myself not to jump, but hearing the voices saying you must die, and now saying, jump now, jump now. It was so clear, it was crystal clear, and it wouldn't go away. you are hearing illustrate the thoughts going on in the minds of these three people 
in the time leading up to their highly lethal suicide attempts. You've already blown it with this, with this class. Now you've got to kill yourself. You know, you can't, you can't fail this. I remember saying that to myself, that, you know, once, I bought, once, you, once, once you buy the gun, you can't go back. So finally, I, um, I went back through the whole thing, and I, the safety on, the safety off, the safety on, the safety off, my head, my mouth, my chest, my gut, and as I had it to my gut and was pressing on the um, trigger, it went off. You should do this. This is something you should do. I mean, sometimes it, it, I remember it's being rational like that. This is really something you should do. You thought about it long enough. You decided you're going to do it. Now do it. Now quit, quit fooling around and just get it over with. Go ahead. Quit fooling around already. Now you've got these pills. Go ahead and start taking them. At this point, it was abundantly clear. You must die. You must die. I walked back and forth across the span. Finally, I found a spot, hey, this is it. This is the place I'm going to end my life. Nobody cares. It's time to go. I turned, walked back toward the railing next to the roadway on the bridge, next to the traffic. I ran, and I shoved myself, only using my arms, over the bridge. So you can see um, how each of these individuals was thinking um, at the time they attempted to take their own life. And these were all very lethal suicide attempts, including Kevin's uh, jump from the bridge. I think it's also striking to think about, as Trish, the blonde woman, was talking, how she was pulling on the trigger, but it went off. There's this disconnection um, or disassociation that is a big part of the suicidal state. And I'll talk a bit more about that as we go along. So basically, I'd like to introduce you to our approach to suicide. And when I say our approach, I mean that of myself and my father, Dr. Robert Firestone. And there's a couple of premises behind our approach. One is that each person is divided, that part of us is goal-directed and life-affirming, our real, our positive self. And a part of us is self-critical, self-hating, at its ultimate end, potentially self-destructive. Now, the nature and degree of this division is going to vary. And it's going to vary a great deal depending on our early life experiences. But this division exists within all of us. <clears throat> also, negative thoughts that people have toward themselves exist on a continuum, from mild self-critical thoughts that we all have at one time or another, like you get up to give a presentation like this and you think, who's going to want to hear what you have to say? <laughs> Not an uncommon thought. I think the number one fear in America is public speaking. <laughs> I think de death ranks about number three. Um, and I used to feel that way, so I can identify with that feeling. Um, all the way up to extremely self-hating thoughts and actual thoughts about suicide. So thoughts like, you don't deserve anything. You, shouldn't be, you should just be by yourself. You're a creep. You need to have a drink so you can relax. You should just kill yourself. There's a whole continuum of self-destructive thoughts that people experience. There's also a whole continuum of self-destructive behaviors that people engage in. Everything from just limiting our life and being self-denying to engaging in behaviors like substance abuse that truncate or shorten our lives, potentially, um, and all the way up to suicide. So everything from self-denial to isolation to extreme self-hatred to substance abuse, risk-taking, and actual suicide. And lastly, our last premise is that there's a relationship between those two continuums, that how a person is thinking about themselves does a lot to let us know how they're likely to behave. It can help us to predict, it can target where we need to intervene, um, and it can also measure how effective we've been in intervening with somebody who's been at risk. So there's events that happen to all of us, but then there's our thoughts about those events, which also influence our feelings, and our behaviors. And the feelings and thoughts influence each other. But if we can get a hold of those thoughts, we can do a lot to prevent suicide. And again, the person who's suicidal, it's not, these are not realistic thoughts. These are seeing things through a negative filter. 
So I just wanted to find this thought process or these negative voices that drive suicidal behavior. The critical inner voice that we're talking about here refers to a well-integrated pattern of destructive thoughts toward ourselves and toward others. The quotes voices that make up this internalized dialogue are at the root of much of our maladaptive behavior. This internal enemy fosters inwardness, distrust, self-criticism, self-denial, addictions, and a retreat from goal-directed activities in life. The critical inner voice affects every aspect of our lives, our self-esteem and confidence, our personal and intimate relationships, and our performance and accomplishments at school and at work. So where do these critical inner voices come from? And how do they get passed from one generation to the next? Because in our 30-year longitudinal study, what we have found is that children very much have similar negative thoughts toward themselves that their parents do. And this is in spite of the fact that the group we've been working with, the parents have had, the older generations in our sample have had much more uh, trauma in their childhoods than their children have had. And yet their children have much the same negative thoughts about themselves as their parents do. Um, I'm going to show you this brief clip. Um, of a mother talking about her critical inner voices and then her daughter talking about them. Now, I apologize in advance for the language in this clip because these critical inner voices, when they are verbalized in an emotional way, often are not said in nice language. So hopefully we have no children in the room. Um, but we do have some negative language. And this is a mother who had a huge amount of trauma in her early childhood. Her mother deserted the family when she was only two years old. Uh, she lived with a father who was intermittently very explosive. One funny story in the family is where she got milk on her under, upper lip. This is now a commercial, right? But she was in the high chair and she got milk on her upper lip and he came across the table at her and she was so afraid of him that she wet on her dad. This was a funny story. Um, her father went through two more failed relationships, so all these transitions. And um, the children were often neglected and left to fend for themselves. And when she was 10, she was finally put on a train back to her mom. A mom she, mother she didn't even remember. A mother who made fun of her because she would stutter in front of her. Um, a mother who gave her medications to get her to go to sleep and leave her alone. Really traumatic childhood, I think, in anybody's estimation. Her daughter, Jenny, who you're going to hear speak after her, has had nowhere near this level of trauma. She was a wanted child who has been in a stable situation, um, and it's not the same level of of trauma at all, but she has very similar negative thoughts to her mother. And the film of Jenny was done um, five years prior to the filming with her mother. It's not that she heard her mom saying these things either. Um, and her mother is quite emotional in the film that I'm going to show you because her older brother has just lost his life to suicide. Oops, go back to it. And Sarah, can you put on the film? Catherine verbalizes voices she experienced following her brother's suicide. I was going to ask you a question. What voices do you think you had after you found out that your brother had died? What did you tell yourself? Like... Say it as a voice if you can. It's like he was the perfect one. It's like, how can you be alive? You're the fucked up one. You're the one who never did anything right, never did anything responsible, never did anything. You never did anything. And he did everything right. And he's dead. He's the one who's dead. You should be dead. You're the one who should be dead, not him. He did everything right. He was, he was smart. He did everything right. He had a family. He had a wife. He had everything. You're the one who's supposed to be dead. You're the fucked up one. You're the stupid one. You're the ugly one. You're the one who was never supposed to be born. 
I was never supposed to be born. <laughs> I mean, I just kind of sneaked out. <laughs> That's what I feel like. I feel like in my whole life, I just kind of sneaked in. <laughs> I was never supposed to be born. And I was never had, supposed to have a wife, much less a wife like I have. Just not entitled to it. <laughs> I wasn't even supposed to be born. It's like nobody was happy that I was born. <laughs> so in a way, I don't even believe, I don't even believe people. I, I feel like I'm very um, skeptical. I don't believe people. I don't believe something on some basic level that I could be somebody that somebody would <laughs> like or care about. I have voices. How do they go? They're like Bobby, sort of. How do they go? They're like, you're not worth it. You shouldn't be on this world. No one likes you. No one cares what you want. No one cares. No one wants to hear what you have to say. No one wants to get anything for you. No one wants to be nice to you because you're not nice to them. Where'd you get an idea like that? I mean, those ideas. Where do you think they come from? I don't know. When I look at sometimes when I look at them as for Catherine, I think the amazing of me like that. Mm -hmm. And that if they didn't think of me like that, they'd be nicer. They would be so cold. So you read it me. from you read it from their behavior. Not even things they necessarily said. You know what I mean? This is, and these are not a realistic perception of herself. This is a little girl who was so generous that everybody wanted to do things for her. But that's the filter she's seeing the world through. And it's so similar um, to how her mother feels about herself. So, I'm going to take us back to attachment theory a little bit. How many of you are familiar with attachment theory? Okay, so we're just going to touch on this. But I think that this is important in terms of understanding this. Um, here's Sir John Bowlby, the founder of attachment theory, um, also occurring at the same time as Harry Harlow's studies with his rhesus monkeys that you might remember um, with the wire mothers and Renee Spitz doing work on infants in orphanages who were getting all their physical needs met, but they were failing to thrive. Um, so starting to understand how important early childhood experiences were. And Mary Ainsworth, who then carried on the research on attachment, um, looking at infant's reaction in this, quote, strange situation where uh, you bring a mother and child into the lab and the playroom with toys, and the uh, child goes down and plays with the toys, and the mother leaves, and she comes back, and she leaves, and she comes back. And what you really measure in terms of attachment behavior is on the second reunion. Um, how, does the, how do the mother and child interact? We'll talk a little bit more about that. 
And then I'm also going to refer to the work of Mary Main and Eric Hesse up at the University of California at Berkeley in terms of two things that they added to the attachment research. One is the disorganized attachment category, um, which was a, a third type of insecure attachment and the most concerning type. And also, and the, when they discovered this category, by the way, and Mary, Mains, uh, Mary Ainsworth went back and looked at all her failure to classify cases in the strange situation, they all fit into this disorganized attachment category. And also, Mary Main and uh, colleagues developed the adult attachment interview, which is a one-hour structured interview that you do with a parent that predicts what type of attachment their child will have with them. And each parent it, is different, obviously. Um, and that interview can be done before the child is born and it will predict what kind of attachment the child is going to have <clears throat> to the parent. So um, the patterns of attachment, the different categories, we have secure attachment, which is optimal. Um, this is a parent who is emotionally available, perceptive, and responsive to the child. What it looks like in the strange situation is a baby who can go to the parent for comfort. Um, and gets comforted. It, they're upset when the parent leaves, but they get comforted and they can go back down and explore the environment. Um, what it looks like on the adult attachment interview is somebody who can tell a coherent narrative about their early childhood um, and remain in good communication with the investigator. It's not a matter of how negative their childhood has been, but whether they've been able to feel the full pain of their childhood and make sense of it that predicts an adult attachment interview. In terms of insecure avoidant attachment, what that looks like in terms of a parent is a parent who's emotionally unavailable, imperceptive, unresponsive, and rejecting. And the child adapts to this by learning that the best way to get your needs met in this situation is to act like you don't have any. So what it looks like in the strange situation is a child who acts like they don't care when mom leaves, they don't care when she comes back, they keep playing with the toys. But if you put a heart rate monitor on these kids, they're anxious the whole time she's gone, and they feel better when she's in the room. What it looks like in an adult attachment interview is somebody, when you ask them about their childhood, they say, uh, don't remember much before I was 15, it was fine. Next question. They are not able to access or talk about their history. Insecure, anxious, ambivalent attachment. Um, what does that look like in terms of a parent? A parent is inconsistently available. Sometimes they're perceptive and responsive. Other times they're intrusive or acting out of their unmet needs. Um, what the child learns that is if they cling, they get their needs met. So what it looks like in the strange situation is a child who's quite clingy, has trouble going down and exploring the toys. When mom comes back in, they go to mom for comfort, but they don't get comforted. They, they cling because they found that eventually you get your needs met if you cling. What it looks like on the adult attachment interview is when you ask this person about their childhood, they start to tell you about their childhood, and then they launch into it like it's still going on. So. You know, not only when I was a kid did my mom prefer my brother, but you know, just last week she came to town and she visited my brother and took his kids to Disneyland and didn't come see me. And that's not what you asked about. You're asking about their childhood. Most concerning in terms of attachment patterns is disorganized attachment. And this is where the parent is either frightening directly or acts frightened when the child comes to them for comfort, which is terrifying to a child. Um, and they do things that are disorienting and alarming, unpredictable, so that there's no organized strategy for getting your needs met by this parent. What it looks like in terms of the strange situation is a child who does things that don't make sense. They start to go toward the parent, but then they get close and they run away. Or they try to run out of the room past the parent. Um, or maybe they run up and hit the parent. They, are they don't have an organized strategy for getting their needs met by this parent. What it looks like on the adult attachment interview is when somebody's trying to talk about their childhood, it's an incoherent narrative. They say things that don't make sense, but they don't say, well, you know, I know it doesn't really make sense, but they don't notice that they're not making sense. And they often will say things like, you know, it was really loving, well, uh, or except for that time they beat me, oh, well, you know, but, you know, it was really a loving, you know, uh, and there'll be these pauses where they kind of freeze. And in doing the adult attachment interview and scoring it, you look at these pauses, they're significant how long it takes people to answer, how the communication flow goes during the interview. Um, if we look at in low non-clinical, low risk non-clinical populations in America, about 55 to 65% of kids and parents, their relationship uh, is scored as secure. 
about 5 to 15 percent have that ambivalent kind of clingy attachment. Avoidant attachment is 20 to 30 percent of the general population. These are not people who often show up in our psychotherapy offices, um, except when they're dragged by marital partners who are very frustrated with them for being emotionally unavailable. And disorganized attachment is something like 20 to 40 percent of non-clinical populations. And the reason that disorganized, why that doesn't add up to 100 percent is because when somebody's given disorganized, they're also given the next best fit alternative. So it can be disorganized secure, disorganized ambivalent, or disorganized avoidant. It, but in high risk, parentally maltreated samples, what we see is disorganized attachment is more like 80 percent, much higher. So, what causes disorganized attachment? What the research has found is unresolved trauma and loss in the life of a parent uh, statistically predicts disorganized attachment or attachment style in general far more than maternal sensitivity ratings done in the home many times within the first year of life, child temperament, social status of the family, or the culture of the family. So what's going on at these moments of stress for parents who have unresolved trauma and loss? And I think it helps us to look at the difference between implicit and explicit memory. Implicit memory is online from the last trimester of pregnancy um, throughout our lives. So we do on some level have a memory for being completely merged with another person as we were before we were born. And the best way to think of implicit memory is if I got on a bicycle here and asked you to ride it, you would get on the bike and start to ride. You wouldn't think about how do I ride? You just, motor memory is implicit. You would just know how to ride the bike. But explicit memory is like if I asked you to tell me the story of how you learned to ride a bike. If you told me that story, you would feel like you were remembering, and you would tell me the story of who it was who taught you to ride the bike. So how does disorganized attachment get passed from one generation to the next? What happens at moments of stress between parent and child is that implicit memories of terrifying experiences in, that the parent had that are unresolved may create impulsive behaviors on the part of parents, distorted perceptions, rigid thoughts and impaired decision-making patterns, and difficulty tolerating a range of emotion from their child. Um, <clears throat> a brief word about suicidality. Um, I'm not going to go into this whole thing, but uh, often this is what's going on in moments of stress between parent and child. So we're going to do the brain in the palm of your hand. This comes from Dr. Dan Siegel, who spoke at this conference a number of years ago. And I've been studying with him and his work in interpersonal neurobiology for about the last six years. So I'll share with you his handy hand model of the brain. So if you put your hand up, <laughs> this is our model of the brain that we always have with us, right? And if you think of your wrist coming up into your palm as your, uh, as your spinal cord, and the base of your... Uh, your palm is the base of your brain, your brain stem area. It's part of our brain that's uh, millions of years old that we share with all reptiles and um, other animals. And that part of our brain is what does all the automatic functions, our heart rate, our breathing, our blood pressure, things we don't think about. And then if you fold your thumb over your palm and think of this as the limbic areas of your brain, um, something we have in common with all mammals. Yes, your dog has feelings or your cat. Or your rat, it turns out. If you tickle rats, they laugh. They laugh at a frequency that we can't hear without a transducer. But if you don't believe me, go on YouTube and Google rats laughing, and you'll get Yach Pink Schnapp, uh, a brain scientist, tickling a rat. And they follow your hand around when you do it. They love it. They actually really like getting tickled. Um, and then if you take your fingers and you put it over that limbic area, this is your cerebral cortex, something we have in common with all of the uh, great apes, and most developed in human beings is this area behind your middle two fingernails, behind your eyes, that's what we call the middle prefrontal cortex. And this is a very important part of your brain because it's very integrative. It integrates, integrates information from your cerebral cortex, from the limbic areas, and directly gets messages from the body, too. Okay? And what happens at moments of stress is we, quotes flip our lid. And our emotional centers of our brain get firing out of control without the oversight of our cerebral cortex. And we lose the nine important functions of our middle prefrontal cortex, which I'll go over now. So what are those nine functions? One is it allows us to regulate our bodies. How many of you remember Phineas Gage from early psychology classes? He was the original experiment in a damaged middle prefrontal cortex. 
This was a railway worker during the time they were building out the railway across our country who was hammering in a spike, hit dynamite, and it went back up through his skull. He survived, but his personality was completely changed from a mild-mannered, easygoing guy to a very explosive, unable to regulate person. We lose attuned communication with others. That's our middle prefrontal cortex allows us to have attuned communication, emotional balance, to have a break and accelerator that are in, uh, run smoothly, to have response flexibility, to be able to pause before we act, to have empathy, to be able to understand another person's experience, to have self-knowing awareness or insight. There's our book, Conquer Your Critical Inner Voice, which can help with this. <laughs> Fear modulation, that when we get afraid that we can calm it down. This is the sticky switch that we see in people with OCD. Intuition and morality. People who have damage to this part of their brain don't become immoral, they become amoral. They lose a moral compass. So these are nine very important functions, right, that we'd like to have our brain online. They are also all now been found to be, through research, outcomes of secure attachment. And there is earned secure attachment that can co come about by psychotherapy or by getting into a relationship with somebody with healthier attachment than you have and staying in it for a long time. Um, but we can develop this part of our brain. We also know they're all outcomes now of mindfulness practices. And people who do mindfulness practices actually grow their middle prefrontal cortex. The original research we had on this from fMRI studies was that people who had long-term mindfulness practices had bigger, thicker middle prefrontal cortex. We now know that if you engage in mindfulness practices, you can actually grow your middle uh, prefrontal cortex. So um, when people have disorganized attachment, it predicts later chronic disturbances of affect regulation, stress management, hostile, aggressive behavior toward ourselves and toward others. And it's interesting because I think it's important to think about the fact that while suicidal people are different, they are a diverse group, one thing they have in common is low tolerance for strong, unpleasant emotions and not good, healthy coping strategies for bringing those emotions down. Those are the two things that suicidal people have in common. Um, so. What's the infant's response to trauma? There's two responses that occur. One is hyperarousal. First, there's a very hyperaroused state, and then dissociation. And there's a lot of research linking dissociation to violent behavior um, towards others. But there's now research coming online that shows that dissociation plays a big role in suicide, too, that people are in a disconnected state. Um, and this is the work of uh, Steve Porges on the polyvagal theory. He's looking at the vagus nerve, which is at the base of our brainstem. And the vagus nerve, its job is to perceive whether our environment is safe, dangerous, or actually life-threatening. When we think that the environment is safe, we use our facial, uh, facial cues and verbal uh, ability to verbalize to communicate with other people. But when we think the, endanger, the environment is dangerous, we go to, into fight or flight mode, and all of our uh, blood flow goes to our big muscles, and we get ready to either flee or fight. And if we actually think the environment is life-threatening, we go into a shutdown state, where there's actually a decrease in our heart rate and in our breathing. And that level of shutdown or immobilization, um, I think, is what we have to be concerned about in terms of suicide. It's that disconnected state. So I'm going to go into um, this division that exists within each of us with a little bit more depth. Um, we believe that this division within each of us originally stems from parental ambivalence. Now, I'm not trying to blame parents here. I'm a parent, um, and I would guess that many of you are as well. Got a lot of parents out there? Yeah. Okay. Uh, but parents are real people, and we have mixed emotions toward ourselves. There's ways that we like ourselves or care about ourselves, and there's ways that we're critical and self-hating. And we tend to extend both of those reactions to our products, to our children. This is not an intentional process. Parents do not have, parents have children with the best of intentions. But the degree to which we have unresolved trauma or loss, we're going to have difficulty, particularly at moments of stress with our children. Because nothing triggers unresolved issues from your childhood like children, and particularly your children that look a lot like you and have behaviors that are somewhat similar. 
<clears throat> the positive side of this leads to the part we like to think about, parental nurturance, but the negative side can lead to parental rejection, neglect, and actual hostility at those moments of stress. There's also prenatal influences that are obviously going to have an impact, things like disease or trauma. We know that uh, second trimester insults during pregnancy are risk factors for suicide, whether that be having the flu or some kind of uh, traumatic experience. There's things that are more active on the part of parents, like substance abuse or domestic violence that also impact the developing fetus. Um, there's also birth trauma, which impacts suicide risk and factors about the baby themselves, the genetic structure that the baby's born with, their temperament, their, the physicality of the baby, the sex of the baby. The positive side of this leads, uh, is made up of the unique individual uh, characteristics that we all have, the unique biology that we all are, along with an incorporation of positive attitudes from our early caretakers, the nurturing experiences we get from parents and from others. And when we look at resilient kids who do well in very bad situations, there was at least one caring adult, um, can make a huge difference. And the good take home message from this is we can all be that one caring adult in a child's life. Um, this positive side of self is made up of a realistic positive attitude toward ourselves, not an inflated one, but a realistic positive attitude and compassionate attitudes towards others that lead to ethical behavior toward ourself and toward other people. Our goals, the real things that we need and want and give our life meaning that lead to goal-directed behavior. And our own moral principles, our own moral compass, which lead us to act with integrity, where our words and our behaviors actually match. In terms of the anti-self or this negative side of the self, it's also made up of the unique vulnerability of the individual our predisposition, temperament, genetic structure, along with any destructive elements of our early life experiences. Uh, rejection, neglect, hostility, over-permissiveness of parents, which feels like neglect to children and is experienced by, as not caring, along with other factors that can happen in the early life of a child. Accidents, illnesses, sep traumatic separations from parents. If you think about um, in terms of military suicide, which we'll be talking about next, parents that are deployed um, is one of those traumatic separations for kids. And we now have some families with dual deployed, both parents deployed. Um, I saw a young girl recently who had that situation. Um, and then death anxiety. Somewhere between the ages of three and seven, children start to understand death. And when they do, that also uh, makes them want to be more defended. So. We believe that the core defense is something we call the fantasy bond, or an illusion of connection, where the child starts to feel merged with the parent by parenting themselves. So at times of stress, they start to parent themselves, both punishing themselves and nurturing themselves, much as they were treated early in their life. In terms of the self-punishing part, what we found is three levels or stages of self-attack, just critical thoughts toward ourselves, which lead to a verbal attack against ourselves that make us feel alienated from others as well. This can come from critical, critical parental attitudes or labels people receive in the community, at school. Uh, peers can be quite cruel as well. And unreasonable age-inappropriate expectations parents can have of children. In terms of micro-suicidal injunctions or the types of negative thoughts that support the cycle of addictions, um, the self-punitive part of that is when people engage in addictive behavior, they beat themselves up for it. They've been bad. They deserve to be punished. But what happens as they beat themselves up is they feel more and more psychologically distressed and they're more likely to drink the rest of the bottle to try to get rid of that feeling. It's part of the cycle. We don't get over addictive behaviors by beating ourselves up. If it worked, we wouldn't have the problem with addictions we have in our country. And these are lessons that we often learn by identifying with ways our parents defended themselves. These are not lessons taught with words. These are behaviors that we observe. And then most serious in terms of the self-punishing part are suicidal injunctions, suicidal ideation, and actual suicidal behavior, resulting in actions that actually jeopardize the ongoing life of the person, extreme risk-taking, uh, carelessness of one's body, attacking oneself directly. And often, this comes from these particular moments of stress when the person, not the parent as they were on the average, but at extreme times of stress when they've lost it with the child, the child internalizes that and later acts out that same kind of aggression toward themselves. In terms of the self-soothing part of this, this is just self-soothing attitudes that we have toward ourselves that lead us to limit ourselves and 
be overly cautious with ourselves, not take risks or go after the things we really want in life. Again, if we had parents that were particularly overprotective of us um, or who were overprotective of themselves, we may adopt these patterns. Self-aggrandizing thoughts. This is the op, you know, we think about self-esteem and there's a big difference between self-esteem and desperately wanting to think well of yourself, which is more of this inflated self-esteem issue. A verbal buildup of ourselves of how we're perfect or we have to be perfect and if we're not perfect, we're nothing. And this can come from parents who build up a child or a parent who needs the child to be a great artist because I need to be the mother of a great artist. <laughs> so you will be a great artist and you will get straight A's. Um, suspicious paranoid thoughts towards others which feel self-protective um, but can lead to a lot of destructive behavior toward other people and these are a lot of the thoughts that precipitate violent behavior toward others. And we can learn these from parents' attitudes towards people who are different or other, or if we've had a lot of uh, abuse experiences, we're gonna have paranoid, suspicious ideas towards other people, or if we've grown up in a dangerous situation, a dangerous environment. Um, in terms of the addictive behaviors, the self-soothing part of this are the thoughts that seduce the person into the behavior to begin with. Have a drink, you really need to relax with those people tonight. Have an extra piece of cake, you've been good on your diet all week, it won't matter. And those seductive thoughts that we need to get a hold of if we're going to really deal with the cycle of addictions. And again, we pick these up from how our parents soothe themselves or other significant people in our early life. And then overtly violent thoughts. And while some people may use self-harm as a way of regulating their emotions, some people use outwardly directed aggression to regulate their emotions as well. And they use exploding at others. And of all the violent individuals we interviewed for the work we've done extensively on developing scales to assess violence potential and making films about it, all of the violent individuals we interviewed were also suicidal. There was never, we didn't find one who had not been, including gang members who told us, yeah, when you're running into, you know, um, a barrage of bullets, you're suicidal. <clears throat> I'm not going to show this developmental clip right now because we don't have time. Um, if I have time at the end, I'll, I'll come back to it. So what happens in suicide? There's an underlying vulnerability that is then triggered by a, a stressful event, um, which can actually be caused by the underlying vulnerability that leads to the stressful event. So you're engaging in substance abuse because of the underlying vulnerability, and that creates stressful events because then your life's not working out so well and things fall apart like a relationship that leads to acute mood changes. And then there's either inhibition against suicide because of strong taboo, in your family, in your culture. Um, there's available support. There's access to mental health services, like the ones we heard about at the beginning of the day today that are so valuable here in this community. Um, and then there's uh, things like uh, religious beliefs or spirituality that might be protective as well. But when there's these acute mood changes, there can also be things that facilitate the person, um, like a weak taboo against suicide, for instance, in our family, there have been a number of suicides. Could be could weaken the taboo if somebody's had that history, or somebody in our community recently died by suicide, or somebody else at my high school died by suicide. Um, the, it, there's easy access to lethal means. That's why bridge barriers are so important, <laughs> or restricting means in general as an important strategy for preventing suicide. Um, there's a recent example will help facilitate it. There's a state of emotional agitation and agitation and that agitated level of anxiety and desperation are the main feelings that drive suicidal behavior and being alone. The more isolated the person is, the higher the risk. And this can mean the difference between survival and suicide. Um, I'm not going to show this either because it's long. Um, Oops, I'm going backwards instead of forwards. I'm going, why do I have this film again? Okay, so what about this continuum of negative thought processes? Um, I'm just going to put these up. Our first five levels all make up a factor that we call low self-esteem or, or inwardness. They're everything from just living your life in a way that's self-denying um, to engaging in isolation. And isolation here at level four is a key factor of risk for suicide. These are the thoughts that just be by yourself. You're a miserable company anyways. And when people get alone, when they're in a self-destructive state, things get much worse. It's much better to be around people who care about you. 
Level five are vicious self-abusive thoughts that lead to a lot of the agitation and distress and desperation that drives suicidal behavior. And again, this is not a realistic evaluation. It's these extremely self-destructive, self-critical, self-hating thoughts. Level six are the cycle of addictions thoughts, you know, both the, the seductive thoughts and the self-punishing thoughts. And then the last five levels all make up a fa factor we actually call self-annihilation. And they're everything on level seven and eight, turning suicide around and feeling like you're doing your family a favor because you're such a burden. And perceived burdensomeness is a necessary factor for suicide to occur. So these are thoughts that are like, see how bad you make your friends and family feel? They'd be better off without you. Now, I've talked to a lot of people who've lost loved ones to suicide. Families never feel better off without the person. That is, it's always this negative filter through which the person is seeing it, though. And if we want to assess suicide risk, we need to get into their mindset. It's not that their family doesn't care or they're not there for them. It's that they're not, they're thinking they're going to do, spare their family this burden of themselves. Um, there's thoughts influencing the person to give up priorities, favorite activities. They're disconnecting from their self. The things they used to love to do don't matter anymore. So a person who's cared very much about their appearance who's now coming to work disheveled. Or a person who's cared very much about, a young person who's cared very much about being on a team and now they're not showing up for practice. When the person gives up doing the things they used to love to do, we need to get worried. Level nine are thoughts that lead to self-mutilation behavior. And self-mutilation is a coping strategy for some individuals. It helps them regulate their emotions. And the last thing you want to do in treating them is to rip that away from them. You want to replace it with more healthy coping strategies, but you don't want to just get them to stop. This leads to suicide. Because when it's working for them, they're not very likely to kill themselves. It's when, they, when it's not working for them, they're having to do more self-harm to get the same effect and increasing their risk-taking that we have to get worried. Level 10 are thoughts planning the details of suicide, the where, when, and how a person's going to do it. And some suicides are more impulsive, and some are more planned, but they all have elements of both. And the plan of where, when, and how are you going to do it. And the more easy the access to lethal means, the more likely the person is going to die. Having access to bridges or guns, methods that are almost 100% lethal, is very different than taking an overdose, where you have a long time to change your mind, and we have a long time to intervene, potentially, by somebody else finding you. So only about 25% of people who take an overdose die, end up dying. Big difference. When you jump off the bridge, you don't get a time to change your mind. And again, that ambivalence. At the moment they make the attempt, they often reconnect with themselves, and all of a sudden they want to live, as you'll hear Kevin talking about. Um, level 11 are the actual injunctions to inflict self-injury. These are the thoughts that drive suicidal behavior. You better do it. Can't even do this, can you? It's the only thing you can do. There's a lot of these very destructive thoughts happening right at the end. And there's a number of works that support this. There's the work by Richard Heckler in his book, Waking Up Alive, where he interviewed 50 people who survived very lethal suicide attempts. And they all talked about this thought process that he came to call the suicidal trance. Cognitive therapists tend to call it the suicidal mode or the suicidal cycle. It's a way of thinking that is taken over where the person doesn't see all their options. That's a very narrow window. There's also research in Switzerland that was done by people with people two days after their attempt while they were still in the hospital by Conrad Mikkel and others, a Swiss psychiatrist, that show this thought process very much at the end of people's lives. Um, I think I am going to show you this brief clip. This is Teenagers Talk About Suicide. These are two young people talking about the thoughts that go into their thinking about suicide. Do I have a thought to action clip? I don't know. You know, I always feel like a disappointment, almost. And it makes it hard for me to ask for anything because I, I'm not perfect. And the person that I try and perform like, I can never be, almost. And unless I'm that person, I think that if I'm that person, then I can ask for things. And if I'm not that person, then I don't deserve anything. And I barely deserve friends, money, life, anything. And 
there's times, there, for a while I was having a hard time in school. And right around grading time, I would just get so afraid that I wouldn't be perfect. And I, I somehow I never was. And it would just snowball down to where I'd just think life would be so much easier if I just killed myself. And it was very logical. Life would be simple. There would be no life and I wouldn't have to worry about grades or anything. And I'm always comparing myself to this perfect person that I want to be like. But taking the pressure off. You could kill yourself when you're taking the pressure yeah. off. It's like Cutting can, off the pressure. Yeah. I can feel like a voice or like I can feel like it feels like it comes directly from my mother like like want anything? How could you want anything? You should be happy to be here. Like, you know, you're here and, and you're lucky you're here, you know. Look at all the trouble I had to go through just for you to be here. So you know, you can't want anything, you know, just be happy to be here. Don't want. It's wrong to want. But it's like, I mean, it's like I do, I feel that same way that there's somebody, there's a perfect person that I can't be, that I can't, never live up that to. I'll never live up to. And I think I even like try to, like I, I idealize my friends and think they're that perfect person, but I'm not and I'll never be, mm -hmm. you know, and I put myself mm -hmm. down, you know. But I do feel also that if things are going really hard, and I can't even think of what things are, but you know, if school is going bad or I feel like my friends hate me, that I feel that same way. It's like, you know, why go through all this trouble, you know? If you just, if you just weren't here, you know, you wouldn't have to go through these feelings, you know? And I don't feel like that ser as that serious. I mean, I feel like no. I'm not going to kill myself. But I, there's a voice, or I think it's like a feeling inside, like, you know, look at all this trouble you have to go through, look at all the trouble you're causing, you know. If you just ended it, if there was just no trouble, like if you were dead, there would be nothing. There would be no, you wouldn't be bad because you wouldn't be. Okay, so that kind of negative thoughts. We, we started that talk with those teenagers looking at what do they see as risk factors for suicide in their friends? And they very quickly ended up talking about their own thoughts and feelings. Um, so what about assessing suicide risk? We're going to switch gears here from sort of what goes into what the developmental roots are to how do we assess suicide risk, and then we're going to leave a little time for treatment as well. So I'm going to make a pitch to you to use objective measures when you're assessing suicide risk along with your clinical judgments. And here's some reasons why. Nothing causes us anxiety like dealing with a suicidal crisis. Um, here we're dealing with a life and death situation. And most of us go into the business of being a mental health professional because we want to help people. Um, we feel a lot of anxiety when we're dealing with this kind of situation. Suicidal people often tend to evoke in therapists too and others in their life a feeling of they try to get us to feel like getting rid of them, much like they feel like getting rid of themselves. And often, suicidal clients get passed from therapist to therapist um, and don't get the help that they need necessarily. And we need to look at those feelings within ourselves as actually a sign that this person might be at risk. Because you don't go into this business because you don't like people. So if you have a client walk in that you feel like getting out of your office, there's a reason. It's often because of what it's triggering inside of you. Also, the level of psychological pain and distress this feeling, what Edwin Steinman, the father of suicidology, liked to call psych ache, his, he liked to make up terms, <laughs> including suicidology is a term he made up. Psych ache is another one. And it's for that deep psychological pain, the anguish and despair that people are feeling who are suicidal. If you have never fully felt that, it's hard to fully empathize with somebody who's suicidal. It's hard to know what their experience is like if you've never felt that level of pain and despair. Or if you have felt it, you do not want to go there. You start to empathize and you pull back because it feels too painful. So when they do research, uh, looking at therapists rating their client's level of suicidality and the patient rating their level of suicidality, we consistently underestimate it. So it's a good idea to clarify our clinical judgments with some kind of objective instrument. Uh, there's also such a diverse menu of risk factors that we're handed in terms of suicide risk. 
um, although there's a lot of work now to try to identify which are the ones that are more immediate as opposed to lifetime risk factors that we should be looking at. But that in itself is overwhelming, this diverse menu, you know, and checking off all these boxes. What we really need to be doing is communicating with our client directly. So if we're talking about assessing risk in children, there's a structured interview that was developed by Cynthia Pfeffer. It's in the book, The Suicidal Child. And it looks at all of these different things that are risk factors for suicide in children, young children. Now, it's a good measure um, because it not only helps you get a better idea of the young person's suicidality, but it also makes the primary caretaker who you're interviewing more aware that their child is at risk. And sometimes it's hard for parents to really accept or understand that their child's at risk. Because nobody wants to think that our child would do this, right? But it happens in all kinds of families and to all kinds of parents. And we need to be willing to recognize it when this happens. This is the um, Adolescent Suicide Ideation Questionnaire. This was developed by Ed Reynolds. Um, all of these uh, copyrighted instruments are available from PAR, Psychological Assessment Resources, and we have some materials from them um, that are in the back of the room. Um, but this is a questionnaire. It's kind of an odd because on the outside it says about my life, and when the young person opens it, it's all about suicide and death. <laughs> so it's odd in that way, but it asks very specifically about the suicidal ideation, and it has a shorter version for younger adolescents and a longer version for older adolescents. Um, this is, I'm going to just briefly show you some slides that talk about Columbia uh, Teen Screen Suicide Severity Scale. Uh, the two things that they're mainly looking at is any suicidal behavior that the young person's had and suicidal ideation. They go very deeply into ideation and ask very specific questions because it turns out that the more specific questions you ask in terms of even asking about different methods, somebody who said no to ever having thought about suicide but then you ask them about different methods, on the third method may say yes. And you're kind of like, didn't you hear the first question? But for whatever reason, it's much higher, harder to, to deny the specific. So be willing to ask questions and lots of questions and detailed questions about it. Um, they look at the intensity of the ideation, frequency, duration, controllability, deterrence, and reasons for the ideation. Um, they also look at suicidal behavior in quite a lot of depth. Have you ever made attempt? Have you ever tried to harm yourself? Have you ever done anything dangerous where you put your life at risk? Um, what did you do specifically? Um, getting them to describe it. Going, if there was any aborted attempts, what did those look like? If there was attempts that were interrupted? Um, this is some sample questions from the Beck's Hopelessness Scale. Um, Aaron Beck, the cognitive therapist, has developed a number of measures, but his hopelessness scale is his best predictor of suicide. But even better than generalized hopelessness is personalized hopelessness. When the person is giving up on themselves, that's what we have to, it's not that they're worried about the financial, global warming or the financial crisis, it's their personalized hopelessness. Um, these are our measures. Uh, the Firestone Assessment of Suicide Intent is our brief suicide screener, and the violence, uh, Firestone Assessment of, of Self-Destructive Thoughts FAST is our screener for suicide along, or self-destructive behavior along the whole continuum. And then those are our violence scales. What we ask people to do is just endorse how frequently they're experiencing various negative thoughts toward themselves. We have found that people are much more honest about their thoughts than they are about their behavior. And when you ask about their thoughts, you really get into their minds, and then you can directly intervene with those thoughts in session. These are some of the things you thought, let's address those. You can also see a reduction in whether they significantly reduce their self-destructive thinking as an outcome of your intervention. And this is a, what's called an ROC operating curve. It's looking at the ability of a scale to predict something that would otherwise be, wise be predicted at chance. And um, we were able to demonstrate that our scale was better able to predict suicide than the Beck's hopelessness scale. And uh, you cannot see these, I'm sure, well. Hopefully on your printout, maybe a little better. But what we found is that both inpatients and outpatients who had major depressive disorder uh, scored higher on the higher levels of our scale and the suicide intent composite uh, than people with major depression who were not suicidal and didn't have prior attempts. The same was true for our bipolar sample. The same was true for our substance abuse sample, all of whom scored high on our substance abuse level. <laughs> but there was a real difference between those who were suicidal and not in terms of how they scored on the suicidal items. Same with personality disordered sample. Our personality disordered sample endorsed more negative thoughts than anybody else, um, but there was real differences between those who were suicidal and those who were not. <clears throat> you can use our measures for risk assessment 
for treatment planning, for targeting your interventions directly at the thoughts, and also for outcome evaluation. Has there been significant clinical change or reduction in the person's risk? This is what uh, the record form looks like for the short suicide screener, again, asking about the person's thought process. And we ask them whether they're experiencing these thoughts from never to most of the time. So we're looking at the intensity of the ideation. Um, I'm going to show you this clip, which is David Jobes, um, a noted uh, suicidologist, uh, interviewing an adolescent who has been brought to his parents, brought in by his parents because he, his friend told the parents that he had said some things about uh, thinking about suicide. Um, this is an actor. It is not a real patient because the American Psychological Association who made this tape didn't want to uh, have the situation of actually being, dealing with a, a suicidal adolescent. Um, but as you can see, this, uh, this young man very much portrays um, a suicidal adolescent incredibly accurately. And you can see David's skill in engaging him in looking at the risk and getting him talking about suicide by persisting in asking him about it and connecting with him and then starting to do some motivational interviewing to get him to consider treatment as an alternative. Pete, have you had thoughts of suicide? Is that something that crossed your mind ever? Like it's always something to think about and it's not incredibly practical, it's just, it's there. Mm -hmm. It's an option, it's an out, it's easier, mm -hmm. I guess. See if you have some thoughts. Sure. Yeah. And when you think about it, does it comfort you? Or does it freak you out? Very important question. Less to deal with. A lot less to deal with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in a big way. But when you think about suicide, does it comfort you? Does it feel like something that you could do or that would end, you know, the, the feelings or the things that you're going through, feeling pressured, overburdened, involved with too many things, fighting with friends? There's so many ways to do it. It's got to be easy. I mean, It can be comforting. It's, mm -hmm. I guess I don't, I don't think I'm going to do it. I mean, why not? Why wouldn't you? <sighs> Life is fun, I guess. It's just, you know, play some basketball. I mean, be with friends sometimes when they're not fighting with me or telling me that I do things wrong and misunderstanding and mm -hmm. so when you think about suicide um, do you think specifically how do you think about a method how not you hear so you think stories right. and mm -hmm. And you said there's a, there's, there, there are hundreds of ways to kill yourself. Sure. Does one in particular come to mind? My dad hunts. Guns around the house? Yeah. Yeah. They're in a safe. That wouldn't be too hard. And he takes them out every once in a while. I clean them, I guess. Whatever. Pete, do you find yourself fantasizing about that or being preoccupied with that? Or not. Every once in a while, laying, but I don't sleep much. I don't know why. Mm. But um, I lay and I think about it. I mean, mm -hmm. let me ask you: Have you ever made an attempt before? Mm -mm. Why not? Haven't quite worked up the guts. Mm -hmm. Feels like something that you'd have to have courage to do. Yeah. Uh -huh. Have you gone about 
I don't know, making preparations for your death? Have you gone around, you know, maybe writing a suicide note or uh, giving away something special to somebody, saying goodbye? I write things down a lot. I like a journal. I don't like talking to people much. It's uh -huh. not like they ever help. Uh -huh. But I guess I could give that to someone uh -huh. if I needed to. Uh -huh. Have you ever actually gotten a hold of a gun, like put it to your head, or sort of rehearsed it in any way? the gun once. Mm -hmm. What was that like? <laughs> Powerful. Mm. Powerful. Yeah. Powerful because something like that could just has the power to change everything and mm -hmm. Sort of clears the deck, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. One little pull. Yeah. Not much work, big result. Yeah. So why didn't you pull the trigger when you did that? What stopped you? When you go to basketball practice. Mm. Do you regret it? Wanted to play basketball that day, that's all. Okay. But when you look back on that moment that you felt so powerful, do you regret not having pulled that trigger? No. Honestly. Now, for some people, Pete, they think about this or they get close, they feel powerful, they feel like it's a way that they can end their suffering. Sometimes they also feel like it's the big flip off, you know, to people that make them mad or betray them or who overtax them, like certain parents that you may know. Is that wrapped up in this at all for you? I don't want to be sad. I just. You don't want them to be sad. Not. All I ever do to my friends is make them feel bad and worry, and I was getting fights, and I never see other friendships like that. Mm. Do you think Pete would be better off without you? Yeah, it's less of a hassle, less of a burden. Mm -hmm. Do you think your folks would be better off without you? Sometimes. Because mm. you're such a pain in the neck. They really love me and all that, but I don't know how much they like me. Mm. You know, it's the worst at night. Because you have trouble sleeping. Yeah. And with the darkness, and you just kind of sit there. There's nothing else to do. Yeah. Just trapped yeah. up here. Yeah. It's never fun. Yeah, it sounds really hard. Probably in your experience, you know, you don't have a lot of people, A, who are interested, B, who get you. The one person who was interested was killed tragically in a car accident. And yet, if you work with me, then there's a the problem that makes your parents right, and I think that would be a really tough thing to accept. Or, the alternative model is that we could find a way to work together with the understanding that you can always kill yourself later. I don't see that much of a difference between now and later, but... Oh, there's a gigantic difference between now and later. See, the fact is that I can't prevent you from killing yourself. And as you say, you know, this is something you think about. It gives you comfort. 
and it's something that feels like really powerful. So on one level, I don't want to take that away from you because you don't have any power. You have very few things that comfort you. On the other hand, I'd love to give you something that gives you power or comfort or meets the same needs without costing you your life. That's what I'd like. But I think that's a lot to ask of you. I really do. I think it's a lot to ask of you to not kill yourself when it's so powerful and so seductive where you could wipe the slate clean and it would just all be over. Right? Yeah. I get that. So what I would propose to you, and I'm going to say a version of this to your folks when they come back in is, I think you should put it off for now. And I think that you should try to give me a chance to be helpful to you. But I think that's a lot to ask of you. Okay. So there's a couple important things um, that David did in that clip. And one is that he, got, he connected with this young man. Uh, he asked the question of whether it comforted him or freaked him out. That's an important question. You want to know how they feel. And it's a much scarier prognosis when it comforts them, like it did this young man. Um, he also is dealing, get, trying to get him to procrastinate suicide. And um, he's part of the ASHI working group that was started in Switzerland by Conrad Mikkel, David is, and, and I am, and a number of people in this field, where we have to understand that you do, in a way, have to understand the suicidal wish and have tolerance for that as a therapist, while at the same time trying to help the person find a better alternative. And that's part of what he's doing when he's talking about how much this makes this, how much comfort it gives this young man to think about this. At the same time, why not put it off and why not try working with me? And what he proposes to them is, you know, let's take the next six weeks. You could always do this later. And the more that we can get our clients to procrastinate suicide, the more likely they are to stay alive. Again, anything that puts time between the person and their plan, including restriction of means, saves lives, but also are you willing to work with me for some period of time? Okay, so in terms of warning signs, the issue of not sleeping is huge. Research now shows that most people who die by suicide have had serious sleep problems. Anxiety and agitation is one of those right now risk factors. Pulling away from friends and family. Often people think they're just rejecting me, but they're rejecting everybody, turns out. Past attempts, again, even if those attempts were not very lethal, they increase risk. Two or more attempts and lifetime risk is incredibly higher. Extremely self-hating thoughts, feeling like they don't belong, like they don't fit in anywhere. Again, only through a negative filter, their friends may feel like they very much belong. A hopelessness, particularly personalized hopelessness. Rage, uh, impulsive aggression the tendency to react to frustration or provocation with hostility or aggression. It's part of why they drive other people away. Feeling trapped like there's no other alternative, like this young man feels. Another factor, by the way, that was a precipitating factor for this young man in the interview is his sister, the one person who quotes got him, was killed in a car accident. And the question I would have wanted to ask that David doesn't ask is, do you ever wish it was you? Or do you ever think your parents wish it had been you? you or do you want to join her? Yeah. Do you want to reunite with her? Exactly. I'd want to know more about that whole issue. Um, increased use of alcohol or drugs, and by far the most dangerous drug when it comes to suicide is alcohol. The way it interacts with our brain chemistry, it is the most likely precipitant. And 50% of suicides occur under the influence. And alcohol, long-term alcohol problems are the second highest psychological disorder associated with suicide risk. Number one are mood disorders, both major depression and bipolar disorder. Number two is alcohol dependence. Number three is schizophrenia. And again, upwards of 90% of people who die by suicide have a diagnosable mental health disorder. Doesn't mean that they were diagnosed or necessarily receiving treatment at the time of their death. Although a lot of them do come across our paths sometimes during their, sometime during their lifetime. 
feeling that they are a burden to others. This perceived burdensomeness is huge. And again, it's through that negative filter. Loss and interest in favorite activities, the things they used to love to do, they're not doing. Giving up on themselves. Risk-taking behavior. Suicidal thoughts, plans, or actions. The more detailed the plans, the more they've taken action toward the plan, the higher the risk. The fact that he had gotten out the gun and played with it um, and considered it makes it a higher risk. And the method he's deciding on is so lethal. Um, sudden mood changes for the better. Um, having a major psychiatric disorder, again, particularly depressive disorder, bipolar disorder, substance disorder, and pers underlying personality disorders play a huge role. Um, when there's more than one psychiatric condition, dual diagnosis, comorbidity, higher risk. Um, again, personality disorders, particularly cluster B personality disorders like borderline, antisocial, or histrionic, narcissistic. Availability of lethal means. The easier the access to lethal means, the higher the risk. One thing we have to let the know, parents or caretakers of adolescents know is you need to get the means out of the house, whether it's a gun or whether it's uh, the Tylenol, which is the big risk factor in terms of over-the-counter medication. You don't want to have the supersized bottle of Tylenol. In England, they've actually made it so you can only buy little bottles of Tylenol. And the suicide rate went down, and so did the need for liver transplants when they did that. It's that impulsivity. Family history of depression or suicide or substance abuse is going to put somebody at greater risk. Loss of a parent during childhood puts somebody at greater risk. And it could be a death of a parent or divorce. Family discord. Physical or sexual abuse, and sexual abuse actually has a higher correlation with suicide than uh, physical abuse. Lack of support network, poor peer relationships, uh, or lack of connection with parents or others, or feeling like you have that lack of connection, even if they don't feel it. And dealing with sexual orientation issues in adolescence is going to put people at higher risk, particularly identifying with a sexual orientation that you don't feel like is approved by, by your parents, your community. And when you have parent support, you can make a huge difference, which we'll hear about um, from Dr. Caitlin Ryan this afternoon in her project. So some protective factors, family and community connections and support, clinical care being available and accessible to the person, resilience, having more resilience skills. Some people are just more resilient than others. And having more coping skills. And having frustration tolerance and emotional regulation. Some people can sit with feeling bad a long time, and other people don't have that having a narrow window of tolerance is going to put you at greater risk. And in therapy, we're kind of pulling at the windows, at that window of tolerance, so people can recognize when they're getting into crisis sooner, and they have more tolerance and more strategies for dealing with it when they're getting into crisis. Cultural and religious beliefs and spirituality can be protective for people. This is Thomas Joyner's model, and this is the model that our national lifeline runs on. Three things have to be present for people to die by suicide. Feeling like you don't, like you're a burden, feeling like you don't belong, and having acquired capability. And acquired capability is partly this ability to disconnect from yourself. People who have had multiple painful experiences, many operations when they were young, have been in a lot of physically painful situations. It's part of the problem, why we're having the problem we do with our military. People who have been in a lot of traumatic situations are going to have higher risk. Or vicarious traumatization. That's why people in our profession have higher risk, which they do. So. Look out for your colleagues as well. <laughs> um, so they look at assessing the acquired ability. If this person is more fearless than other people, they're going to have more acquired ability. Or they don't avoid painful things, and they don't feel much physical pain. These are people who have desensitization to physical pain, but heightened awareness of psychological pain and distress and uh, ego threats. Burdensomeness. People will be better off when I'm gone, things like that. And belongingness, lack of connection to others. I'm not going to walk you through this assessment and management tree, but if you'd like to see it in more detail, please send us an email. Uh, I'm L. Firestone at glendon.org, and it should be on your last slide, too. I'd be glad to send you this in a full page so you can actually see it um, and look at it. And it just walks us through the things that we need to do in terms of deciding risk. Can the person be maintained as an outpatient, or do they need to be inpatient to be safe? 
If they're going to be outpatient, how do we make their home environment safe? How do we connect them to resources? How do we help bring their friends and family and the people they're in daily contact with on board as a support? What are they going to do when they get into crisis? How can they access you? How can they access other crisis res uh, resources? And when somebody's in crisis, we want to connect with the part of them that wants to live, and we don't want to do anything to support or to weigh with in on the part that wants to die. And that is the main thing in crisis. So multi multiple attempters are particularly high risk because they have a greater likelihood of having abuse or uh, comorbidity of diagnoses in their early childhood. Um, younger at the time of first attempt, even though the first attempts are low lethality, more impulsive, more likely to have substance abuse issues, greater symptom severity in terms of anxiety, depression, uh, hopelessness, more frequent histories of trauma, distinct characteristics of a crisis. When this happens, I get into crisis. I think about a young work woman I worked with who would get into crisis every time there'd be a breakup of a relationship. She did a lot of things to contribute to these breakups, but she still would get in crisis when they would occur. So people attempt at lower and lower levels of distress. It gets easier to do. Um, safety planning. This comes from the work of uh, Aaron, uh, Greg Brown, who also worked with Aaron Beck on developing the cognitive behavioral therapy for suicidal people. And this is something that we now can do in emergency rooms and in first contacts that is much better than an anti-suicide contract. This is a safety plan that we keep a copy of and we make sure the person walks out with. Because sometimes our only contact with a suicidal person is our first contact with them. We want them to have this when they leave us. So what are the warning signs? What are their personalized warning signs that they're getting into trouble? Uh, is it when they are feeling like they want to go to sleep and not wake up? Is it when they're thinking that they want to hurt themselves? Is it when they're feeling like they are a failure? When they start having those thoughts, that's when they're getting into trouble. So how can they recognize a crisis at earlier stages? What are some coping strategies, the things that they can do that help them calm down, that have worked for them in the past? Things like uh, listening to music. We want them to listen to music from a hopeful period in their life, when they were feeling good. Music is incredibly mood-inducing. It can make you very depressed to listen from, to music from those really low periods in your life, but the music from those really better periods in your life will make a bet you in a better mood. Uh, maybe it's rocking in a rocking chair, or going on a walk, or going for a run, or taking a hot bath or a cold shower. Whatever works for them, baking brownies, doesn't matter. What are the things that they can do and easily access that are make them feel better? Help get that cerebral cortex back online. <clears throat> are there people they can contact that just distract them? Not that they have to talk to about being suicidal, but can they call their brother, their parent, their friend, somebody they can just talk to that when they talk to that person, it distracts them from suicide? Could they at least go in a public place, go to Starbucks, go down the block, come out here on the boardwalk, be around a lot of people? That will distract you. Who can they contact that can actually talk to about this? Who are they willing to reach out to in their social network? Again, a family member or a friend. And does that person know what to do when they get that call? I think of a young woman I worked with who the only person in the world she would call was her brother. Okay, but her brother needed to know what to do when he got those calls. How can they get a hold of you? How can they get a hold of the national lifeline or the local lifeline? Local lifelines are better in the sense that they know more about the community's resources and how to access them, but the national lifeline is also available 24-7. That's the 1-800-273-TALK number. That's our national lifeline. There's also online what they call the National Lifeline Gallery, where people can go on and hear stories from people who have been there and have gotten through it. And what they see is an actually animated character that you make of yourself that tells your story. And Dr. Phil is on there with his animated character, also telling them not to do it. Um, so uh, the idea is you sign it and they sign it. But they have this concrete document that helps provide structure in times of crisis to them. Um, so. With adolescents, you can do this as well. How will you know when you should use your safety plan? When do you know you're getting at an elevated risk? What are some of the coping skills you can implement? What are some of the social contacts that distract you from a crisis? Who in your family can offer you help? Who professionally can offer you help? 
And how can we make your environment safer? How can we get things out of the house that when you're in that impulsive mood are going to be potentially lethal? Um, you want to increase their social supports by making lists with them, looking at family resources, looking at friends, how can they join social clubs or get more connected. Anything that gets people more connected can be life-saving. Um, how can we improve or involve their relationships with their family? Um, how can we let help other significant others understand them? Um, so who are the three people you could call? And that's starting to generate that. Okay. This is a crisis response plan, which I won't go into in depth either, but again, it looks at these same issues. What's upsetting me? How am I going to calm myself down? If I do all these things and I still don't feel better, the idea is to take 30 minutes and do them all again. Because again, the more you can procrastinate it, the less likely you are to do it. Um, and then how could I specifically get help if doing all these things still isn't calming me down? Is there a walk-in place in my community? How can I access those services? One of the great resources we have in Santa Barbara, and this is from our film for the public, the helper tasks of how you can help somebody who's at risk, to help train everybody in the general public on what to do when they're worried about a friend, a family member, a loved one. We also have these helper tasks available on our website, Psych Alive. So I'm not going to show them right now, but you can access them and look at them. The idea is these are five things that were developed for the California Helpers Handbook, which we our state funded somebody to write, a Canadian psychiatrist, interestingly enough. It's a very good document, but then they didn't fund distributing it, so it sat in a warehouse. We've turned it into our brochure, our Save a Life brochure, which you can download from our website, our Glennon Association um, website. Things that we tend to fail to do, right, when it comes to suicide prevention, we often over, we can offer superficial reassurance, avoid the strong feelings. The more the client can express their strong feelings to you, the less likely they are to do it. We don't want to make distance between ourselves by standing behind our doctor role. We want to connect with the person as another caring human being in their presence. We want to ask directly about suicide. Even therapists are afraid to talk about it. We need to talk about it and ask. We need to look at the precipitating event, the why now, because if we can deal with the pain about the why now, we can reduce the risk. We don't want to be passive. We need to provide structure for people when they're fragmenting. We need to be very direct. We don't need to be giving advice. We need to be drawing out what works for you when you're in distress. We don't want to just give, this is what I say to all my suicidal clients. That's not helpful. You don't want to get defensive because often these clients will attack you as well because they feel like even you can't help them. You don't understand. And we need to speak to their worry that we can't help them. So when imminent risk does not dictate hospitalization, the intensity of treatment should vary with the intensity of crisis. We need to increase our contact with patients during times of risk, whether that's multiple sessions during the week or check-in phone calls, which Marsha Linehan recommends, um, that are scheduled phone calls, not the one we get at 2 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> easier to deal with. Also, if the target goal is the reduction in suicide attempts and related behaviors, we should conceptualize treatment as long-term and target identified skills deficits, emotional regulation deficits, distress tolerance deficits, impulsivity, problem solving deficits in interpersonal relationships, and anger management. If therapy is going to be brief because of circumstances, uh, we need to build in a problem solving component because this person needs to learn skills that are going to help them to deal with the longer term problems that we're not going to be able to solve in the short term. And regardless of our therapeutic orientation, um, we should have an idea of what it is we're doing and why we're doing it. The more we believe in our treatment model and it can explain it to the client in a way that makes sense to them, the more likely it is going to be effective. So your belief in the model you're using is going to influence the outcome. And it's important to follow up. We know from the postcard study that just sending a postcard after somebody's dropped out of treatment saying, you know, I'm still here, hope you're doing well, if you need me, call me, can save lives, even for treatment-resistant patients who never call. The group who get the postcards stay alive. Uh, that comes from a study done up in the Bay Area by Jerry Motto. So we also want to have informed consent. We want family members to know this is the risk, given your family, your loved one's 
risk factors. This is a high risk. This is what I'm going to try to do. This is how we're going to work together to try to help save your loved one. So um, we also want to get people to commit to treatment, and I'm not going to go through this in detail either, but we want a commitment to treatment and to being actively involved in their treatment. So whatever the outline of our treatment looks like, we want them to commit to that, whether it's making their appointments, being actively involved during session, doing homework if that's part of our treatment, taking their medications as prescribed, being willing to experiment with new ways of doing things that might help them, and implementing their crisis response plan when they're in crisis. This is David Jobes, uh, comes from his CAMS, Collaborative Assessment and Management of Suicide Risk Treatment Model. He says, usually this is the way we approach it, is the therapist sitting above the patient, talking down to them. What we really need to do is collaborate with them. They are the expert on their suicidality, and we need to draw that out of them. He has something he calls the suicide status form. Again, I'm happy to send you a full copy of this. But it asks them to rate the things that drive suicidal behavior, like psychological pain, like self-hatred, like stress, like agitation, um, and hopelessness, and also to rank which one of those is most driving suicide for them. It also, they ask the patient to look, to give reasons for living versus reasons for dying. It turns out people who give you less material of both are the highest risk from his research. And he's done this with military groups, with groups of hospitalized patients at the Mayo Clinic, and also with college students and counseling centers. He also asks, what degree do you want to die and what degree do you want to live? And when this method is employed, the CAMS method, the suicidal crisis resolves more quickly. So what are some effective therapy approaches um, when treating suicidal people? There is now an effective cognitive behavioral therapy for depression, again developed by Aaron Beck and Greg Brown. The most significant feature of this compared to other cognitive behavioral therapies is it is not time limited because the third step is what they call relapse prevention with a twist. And what that means is that before you graduate from this therapy, we induce a suicidal crisis in session, and you have to be able to use the coping skills on your own to get out of that state. If they can't get out of it, you help them as the therapist and walk them through the process of getting out of that state, but they don't graduate from therapy until they can do it on their own. A lot of therapists are afraid of the idea of inducing a suicidal state in session, but what we know about suicidal people is that when they're in that state, all of the coping skills we teach them go out the window. We need to make sure they can use them while they're in crisis. Um, dialectic behavioral therapy, a la Marsha Linehan, um, which was originally developed to deal with borderline women who had acting out in suicidal behaviors, has also been found to be effective. And it, one of the things I think that it stresses that all suicidal clients need is strategies for tolerating emotion and regulating emotion effectively and in healthy ways. And DBT offers that, the DBT skills building model. Um, and also uh, Matt McKay has written a book on skills building um, from a DBT perspective for New Harbinger, as well as the one Marsha has written. Uh, mentalizing treatment, all uh, John Allen and Peter Fonagy, has also been found to be helpful for people who are suicidal. There's now some good research data and transference-focused therapy developed by Kernberg, Clarkin, and Yemens. And our approach is called voice therapy, um, developed by my father, Dr. Robert Firestone, and it's a method of giving voice to these critical inner thoughts. It's a cognitive, affective, behavioral approach. Cognitive, because we're interested in the thoughts. Affective, because we're interested in the feeling behind these thoughts. This is never simply a cognitive process. And it's behavioral, because we're really focused on changing behavior. Um, this is something I think from all perspectives can be helpful, but it came out of the cognitive model, which is constructing a hope kit. This is a box where a person puts things in it that are going to help them when they're in crisis. And then they put that box somewhere prominently in their living space where they can easily access it. Things like a card when they give it to their partner that means it's time you have to sit down and really talk to me and be there for me. Pictures of loved ones, music that makes them feel better, a DVD of a movie that always makes them laugh, whatever it might be that helps them when they're in crisis. Um, it's really important to establish a therapeutic alliance and maintain that alliance and repair any ruptures that happen in that alliance because when we look at people who die by suicide when they're in treatment, there's always been a breakdown of the relationship. 
and keeping our relationship strong with the client can be life-saving, even if we're working from a cognitive behavioral therapy standpoint. Um, so it's really important, even stressed by um, Greg Brown and Aaron Beck, clearly coming from a cognitive perspective, that the relationship is essential when you're treating suicidal people. Um, and they talk about how to maintain that alliance. Um, by making the patient the expert on their condition and really trying to reach out and connect with them about how they see their suicidal story. Um, and also they talk about addressing any barriers. What are going to be the therapy interfering behaviors that the patient's likely to engage in and that you yourself might engage in? And make sure that you're on the same page with the client, checking in with them regularly, that you're understanding what's helping. You want to have one story, a shared story between you and the client about what's going on in therapy. Um, I'm not going to go into our approach, but there's my father and, and his book about this. Um, I'm not going to go through the steps. So one thing I want to share with you before we stop and go to questions, but basically what you're wanting to do is not grow the anti-self of the person, but rather have them stand up to that monster that lives inside of them. Like when Max says goodbye to the things in where the wild things are. Um, I'm not going to show you that treatment clip either. Um, so we need to address the patient's impulsivity because if we're going to save a life, I'm not going to go through these things either. I'm gonna go. These are from interpersonal neurobiology. Ah, this is what I wanted to get to. What did people who were suicidal find most helpful in treatment? What worked for them? Validating relationships were number one. Where they felt that the person connected with them. The person being willing to work with the strong negative emotions associated with suicide was number two on what saved their life. And if the therapist doesn't have, strong, doesn't have tolerance for strong emotions, your client won't go there. And you need to let them go there. Lastly, developing an identity that was life-sustaining. So at the end of the day, while we've done a lot of studying about suicide, if we're going to save people's lives, we need to help make their life worth living to them, help them develop meaning in their life. So, uh, these are some of the common emotions experienced in grief. And when we lose a client to suicide, we go through some all the same grieving that family members and loved ones do. So it's important to take care of ourselves and to deal with these emotions. Um, we need to do. We need to ask for help and consultation when we need it. This also helps us guarantee that we're practicing up to the standard of care. Talk to others. Get plenty of rest. Not uh, drink plenty of water, but not drink plenty of alcohol because that doesn't help us in coping either. Exercise and relaxation skills. We need to keep centered if we're going to do this work. So this is a reminder to take care of yourself. <laughs> and these are some uh, websites that can have a lot of helpful resources for you. The American Association of Suicidology, the International Association for Suicide Prevention. Um, so what are the do's and don'ts? Just quickly, be aware, learn the warning signs, get involved, become available, show interest and support, ask about suicide, be direct, talk openly about it, be willing to listen and allow the strong expression of feelings. The more the person can express the feelings, the less likely they're going to feel that they have to act on them. Don't get into a debate about whether it's right or wrong. Don't be judgmental, but draw the person out. Because if you lecture about why they should stay alive, they'll just stop listening. Um, offer hope that alternatives are available and take action. Don't. Don't dare the person to do it. Um, often people get baited into this by people who are suicidal because they're doing that, putting it out there and taking it back thing. Don't ask why. Why questions make us defensive in general. We don't know why we do almost anything. <laughs> and um, it shuts the person up. Offer empathy for the feeling but not sympathy with the solution. Don't act shocked, because that'll just put distance between you and the person. And don't be sworn to secrecy. Seek support. Here's our books and resources. One, our Conquer Your Critical Inner Voices for the General Public and Suicide in the Inner Voice for Professionals. These are the three films we have about suicide, which you saw some brief excerpts from. Uh, Understanding and Preventing for the for, uh, Professionals, Voices of Suicide, or Understanding and Preventing for the General Public, Voices of Suicide, for professionals, and lastly, Faces of Suicide, which is a uh, survivor uh, film where you see survivors talking about the loss of their loved one and going on and being able to develop meaning after the loss of somebody significant to them to suicide. 
These are, are some of our upcoming webinars, and we have ones that are archived about suicide. And we have ones with experts like Dan Siegel and uh, Donald Meichenbaum and Pat Love. And this is our contact information. So if you want any more of these resources that I wasn't able to share with you, I'm very happy to send those to you if you contact us at either Glendon Association, our website for the professionals, and PsychAlive, our website for the public. Thank you again all for being here today. So I guess we have time for questions. We have a mic over here. Uh, if you would come up to the mic to ask your questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. I'll also be around during the lunch break if you want to ask questions one-on-one. -on -one. So, but it a quick announcement. A lot of folks have been asking about the PowerPoint. Um, we'll also put the PowerPoint up on our website uh, for people to download and color full pages so that you can see some of the detail that you couldn't see um, with your permission. Yes. It works best if you come on up to the microphone if you have a question. What's the website? website? www.calcianayusymposium.org. And we'll put it up on the, the Glendon website as well. No questions. <laughs> ah, here we get one. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm just a parent, but I was wondering if you thought social media, Facebook and stuff has increased or decreased the suicide attempts and suicide ideation? I think it's done both. Um, I think that uh, for young people who are vulnerable, they can, uh, through social media and through websites, there's actually websites that tell, that tell you how to do it effectively um, in terms of suicide that are really a problem. and. People, uh, there are people who will connect with young people and actually encourage them to do this or support it. Uh, Facebook has also been a way to reach out and help get connected that has been preventive as well, so it's very much a mixed bag. Um, it can be a way for kids that don't feel very connected to feel connected, and there are a lot of good resources out on the internet as well that can help people um, and can be helpful to people. Facebook itself has a policy of now reaching out and trying to connect with anybody who shows signs of being worried. Some, if, if friends are worried about a friend, they can contact Facebook and they will help to try to get them resources. So um, Facebook itself is taking a proactive approach about this. Um, but certainly social media can work both ways. <laughs> um, it helps keep us connected on one level, but it isn't quite the same as connecting face to face. And we have a lot of young people that feel more com comfortable on social media. Um, I mean, the main way of communicating has become texting, right? But if we have a young person that's giving away any of their social media devices, their eye, any eye device, we should be worried about their suicide risk. Because <laughs> we, they, they, we actually map these as part of our body at this point. So I don't think we're going to get away from social media. I think it's a matter of what is the young person accessing. And you know, there's both good and bad out there. Thank you. I'm Kaylee from SoCal High School. I'm a student. Um, I've got a question regarding uh, when you know somebody who is suicidal and you know you're trying to help them, but you need to separate you know that your feelings from their feelings to be able to help them. Do you have any suggestions on how to do that? You know methods you can do to like not take on what they're feeling so you can help them. Yeah. And the first thing is we need to kind of calm ourselves down and get ourselves centered when we're dealing with this because we're going to feel upset if a friend of ours or somebody we care about is talking like this. Um, I think we need to take it seriously. And my biggest message to young people is you need to tell somebody. You need to get help with this. Um, young people are often loath to do this because they want to keep their friends secret. And my message is, look, you can't afford to keep your friends secret. You can't afford to let your friend die. You need to reach out and get them help and take it seriously. Um, and, you know, you can call the local hotline. They'll talk to you as well and help you talk you through it. So with the National Lifeline, um, you can reach out and get support from your parents, their parents, somebody at school. You know, it's really worth getting them to the help that they need. You can't take this on and solve all of it yourself. Um, but being a good friend and sticking in there does make a difference. But like this young man who you saw on the, the videotape with David, um, 
he had told his friend, and she got really, really, you know, she was really upset about it and worried about it, so she told his parents, and he was really angry at her. But, you know, even if your friend gets angry at you, at least they'll still be alive so that later on they might be able to be friends with you. It's worth dealing with their anger. They'll usually get over it. Um, they may be angry at first, but eventually they'll really thank you for caring. And so I think it's really important to take these things seriously when we hear them from a friend, even though it's hard because you see all your friend's good traits and you never think that they would do something like this. But if they're talking like this or giving us indications, we're better off overreacting than underreacting. That's what I would say. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so the local uh, person who talked first is going to be at which high school? Oh, at her high school. Okay, your high school. Yeah, come talk to her. Come talk to them. They can help you through this with a friend. Okay, two presentations in April. Great. Uh, John, John Merkling House. I just want to double check. If we download the slideshow, that would, that would include the video clips? Um, if you do it from us, we can give you a full file with the video clips. Um, I don't know if they're going to be able to do that on the website for the conference or not, but if they uh, want to, they are more than happy to. And right, we wait. will make it so you can access them. Do it from you? Yes. If you come to uh, contact us either at Glendon or through Psych Alive, and we'll make them available. Thank you. Yeah, we want you to be able to see the video clips, especially the ones I couldn't show. Yeah. Uh, Carol Berman, therapist. Uh, you, something about self-soothing you had up here as a negative quality. I, maybe I misunderstood. Yeah, I think that um, we're talking about self-soothing in such a way as to cut off emotions. And when we try to suppress our emotions, it's not really helpful. Um, so we're talking about a self-soothing voices that seem self-protective and like it's self-care, but it's not. It's part of that anti-self. I do think we need to have healthy self-soothing strategies, but that's not what the self-soothing part that is part of this uh, anti-self is doing. It's, a, it's suggesting we engage in things like substance abuse to self-soothe, which is not really helpful. It's just going to make things worse. Um, what we do want our clients to have is ways of calming themselves down or helping getting that cerebral cortex back online that are healthy. So Kevin, who you saw at the beginning talking about his jump from the Golden Gate Bridge, one of the things he's learned to do is to put on his running shoes and go for a run. Now he's got himself a big dog that needs to get walked. <laughs> and that will help him to calm down and be able to get back centered in himself. Um, so those kind of self-soothing strategies can be really helpful. Um, I guess I, I guess it would be more clear if it was positive self-soothing versus negative self-soothing. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So there's ways that we can self-soothe that, uh, that lead us to deaden ourselves in a way that is not helpful, but self-soothing that makes us feel calmer and then be able to approach our emotions more directly is helpful. And one thing that helps get that cerebral cortex back online is doing something rhythmical, like going on a run like roller skating, like even just if, you, you know, if you're in your living room and you can't, it's you know, night and you don't want to go out, doing some jumping jacks will help. Some breathing um, and paying attention to your breath will help as well. See, cutting behavior is often thought of as something different from suicidal behavior, and I've seen a number of people who have gone through that and uh, don't seem to go to suicide. But I thought from something you were saying, in a way it almost seems obvious that, that that also is a risk factor. Is that true? Yeah, it is a risk factor when it isn't working for the person. For some people, How could they, that work, though? In a how way? does that work? I mean, well, I mean, that doesn't, so, it's something that doesn't work if one really would. Well, how can we tell when it's not working, when they're escalating, they're having to cut more frequently, they're having to cut more extremely or engage in more self-mutilation behavior? Um, it's going to be worse. The other time they get suicidal, though, is when we rip that away from them. We have a young man in our community who died um, on his 16th birthday, and he had been cutting about a year before. And his mother, being a good, responsible parent, got him into therapy. And the therapist got him to stop. Mm -hmm. But she didn't replace it with healthier, self-soothing strategies. Um, and he spent the six months between when he stopped therapy, which he stopped prematurely, and dying by suicide, every day he had an hour after school where he got home before his parents and he systematically searched the boxes in the attic until he found the bullets. And the day he found the bullets is the day he died. So I guess something like shaming the person on that or some... 
Yeah, shaming them or just trying to get them to stop is not a good idea. We want to replace it with healthier strategies, and that would be really good. We'd rather they went on a run, for instance, or exercise, which is only going to increase their physical uh, health than do something that actually harms them. But for people who engage in self-harm, it really is soothing for them. And we have to at least respect that as a strategy until we get some other ones in place. Yeah, but it can be on a continuum. It is on the continuum of self-destructive behavior, certainly. Eating disorders, by the way, can work that way too. They can be very self-soothing for people. They, they're feeling that control of their life by not letting themselves eat. But again, when that strategy is not working or they're feeling out of control with it is when their suicide risk will actually increase. If there are no other questions, I'd like to thank Dr. Lisa Firestone for a wonderful presentation. Thank you.